At this point, I'd like to lay the ground rules and have all of you ask your questions at the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank all you business owners and CEOs for coming out today. We are a group of executive specialists who specialize in different aspects of uh, business in Japan. Um, today we're going to be talking to you about doing business in Japan. My name is Frankie Mabulu. I'm going to be talking about culture and business etiquette in Japan. Right here, this is Tyler Suggs. He's going to be talking about the economy in Japan. Next to him is Alan Garcia, who's going to be talking about market strategy in Japan. We have Pablo Ceballos, who's going to talk about environment in Japan. And Cameron Kubis, who's going to be talking about government in Japan. As I stated before, my name is Frankie. I'm a specialist when it comes to culture and business etiquette. Today, I'm going to talk about how Japan views time. I'm going to talk about how Japan is a high context culture. And I'm going to talk about different customs Japan has. So Japan is more monochronic when it comes to time, meaning time is very important. So like time is money. So when you're setting up a meeting, you always want to be on time. Um, it's actually a custom in Japan that even if you know you have a meeting, it's always good to call two to three hours before time and make sure that you're coming, make sure that they, uh, <clears throat> make sure that they know you're coming and um, for, they, for they know like how many seats they need or how many people they need at the presentation. The opposite of that is polychronic, which is more European and more African countries have, meaning that they don't care about time as much. So it's okay to show up like 30 to 45 minutes late and like that'll be fine. Um, it's a high context culture, meaning nonverbal expressions mean a lot. So that's why when you're greeted, you bow. And it's also respectful for you to actually bow higher than like the CEO or business owner you're talking to they want to bow lower than you to kind of show a sign of respect. So it's really important that you know that because if you're trying to bow lower than them to show that they're like higher ranking, they'll just keep bowing lower. They can kind of like confuse and that causes um, a bit of like a dis disaster during like the meeting. Um, low context culture, I mean verbal expressions are everything. So that's more like the US. So that's like when you like shake hands and you say, hey, you might be having a conversation while you're shaking hands. Or if you see someone across the street, you might yell out the name, but in like Japan, they don't really do that. <clears throat> they don't really do that. <coughs> um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is different customs in doing business in Japan. Obviously, you have to worry about the language. Uh, Japanese is the main language there, but a lot of them do speak English. So if you do need a translator to make sure you guys are all on the same page, it's always good to bring one with you or call ahead and make sure they have one there. <coughs> Personal space is a big thing. Uh, Japan is not a real big, touchy-feely country, so that's pretty much why they bow. They're not into the whole giving handshakes and giving hugs and things like that. Uh, clothing, uh, when you go for your meeting, it's very important you dress to impress. You want to show up as professional as you can to show you mean business, to show that you're respectful and you're willing to get the job done of whatever tasks you need to do. Food. Japan actually do have a lot of exotic foods there. They eat fish raw, they eat horse meat raw. So if you go to like a meeting that's out of lunch or something like that, you need to be prepared to like try like these different foods just in case if you go out to dinner or like lunch with a CEO. Um, gift exchange, uh, you want to be ready to, if they, they do give you a gift, you might want to be ready to accept it there and open it in front of them. Because most Asian cultures, that's acceptable and it can be seen as disrespectful if you don't open it right there in front of them. So as I said today, or as I talked about today, I talked about how Japan is monochronic, I talked about how they have a high context culture, and I talked about different customs they have. And now Tyler Suggs is going to talk about the economy. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. As Frankie mentioned, <coughs> my name is Tyler Suggs, and I am a specialist on the economic aspect of Japan. I'm going to start this morning on this telling you and giving you a basic infra definition of infrastructure. Then I will go on to explaining how that relates to the economic standpoint of Japan. Then I will go on to giving you the definition of GDP, what that is, and how the GDP has grown over the past 12 years. And then I will go on to giving you the uh, major export industries that Japan has. So first off, 
what is infrastructure? Infrastructure is the basic physical and orga uh, organizational structures needed for the operation and success <coughs> of a country. And so I'm going to give you a little um, bit of like a number crunch here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Japan's infrastructure. So Japan's infrastructure is very extensive and modern with 715,981 miles of highways, which 536,276 miles of those are paved. They include 3,799 miles of expressways, and the number of motor vehicles increased, increased from 70 million to roughly 82 million in the past 12 years, and that is a really, really large amount and it's growing rapidly, so more development is needed. So that is how uh, Japan is keeping up with um, the population boom that has been occurring as well. And now I'm gonna move on to GDP. Uh, GDP, you're asking what is that? GDP is basically the gross domestic product. It's calculated at the end of every year. And so you can see here at this chart, um, you have 2000, the millennium, and you have 2012 today. So over 12 years, you can see like the little rise and fall of Japan's GDP. And you can see right here in between 2008 and 2010, Japan's GDP crashed very drastically to negative four, which is a pretty, it's a pretty um, drastic change. Uh, US's GDP dropped, I think, to negative 3% because at this time, the economic recession was uh, in effect. And you can see right here, there's a slight decline from the tsunami that hit Japan. And Pablo will talk about that later on in our presentation. So um, just to go back really quick to Japan's infrastructure, uh, it's very advanced and well organized, which un it, it, undergoes, uh, it undergoes regular upgrades. And it just keeps increasing, increasing, increasing each year. It is one of the many countries, uh, and it's one of the few countries that their infrastructure is growing more rapidly than any other country with China and then the United States and then India close behind them. So lastly, I'm going to explain Japan's major exports. And so Japan's major exports are automobiles, like um, Alan will talk about later, some car manufacturers like Mitsubishi. So you have consumer electronics, you have computers, and you have copper and steel. So now I'm going to pass it on to Alan Garcia, which is going to tell you a little bit about the market system, contrasting the market system to other countries. Thank you. Hello, and my name is Alan Garcia, and I will be explaining to you um, what exactly Japan, how they have come to become, have they become the world's largest economic giant, and I will also explain about what exactly Japan's aim for their economic expansion is, as well as what kind of market they are using. And last but not least, I will talk exactly about the relationship between the U.S. and Japan. And so like Tyler said, in the last 12 years, Japan has come from a second-rate status to the world's economic giant, leading the world in electronics, automobiles, steel, shipbuilding, and virtually anything else to which it sets its mind to. And the Japanese aim, you might all be asking, is, was and still is to be the world, world suppliers of major high volume items in the largest international markets, especially with automobiles. And not just any automobiles, but cars such as Honda, Toyota, Mitsubishi, Subaru, Acura, Mazda, Nissan, and even <coughs> a Lexus. It may be hard to believe, but this focus on middle to lower end volume markets may made increased efficiency very essential. And the kind of market that Japan uses is an industrialized free market economy, and it is the third largest in the world. And its economy is highly efficient and competitive in areas linked to international trade. But productivity is far lower in protected areas such as agriculture, distribution, and services. And what exactly is the relationship between the US and Japan? There's many relationships that they are currently using, and one of them is that the U.S. economic policy toward Japan is aimed at increasing access to Japan's markets and two-way investments, stimulating domestic 
to men led economic growth, promoting economic restructuring, improving the climate for U.S. investors, and raising the standard of living in both the United States and Japan. And also, Japan is a major market for many U.S. products, including chemicals, pharmaceuticals, films and music, commercial aircraft, non-first moths, metals, plastics, and medical and scientific supplies. And Japan is also the fourth largest foreign market for the U.S. agriculture, and trade between the two countries remained strong in 2010, and the U.S. exports to Japan reached 60.5 billion in 2010, while U.S. imports from Japan totaled to 120.5 billion dollars in 2010. With this alone, one can see that the U.S.-Japan bilateral economic relationship, based on enormous flow of trade, investment, and finance, is strong, mature, and increasingly interdependent, and is still growing. And now, I will pass this on to my associate, Pablo Ceballos, which will talk to you more about the environmental issues. Thank you very much, Alan. I think we can all agree that was very interesting. Uh, Hello, my name is Paulo Ceballos. I am the environmental. Uh, I am the head of the environmental relations for the country of Japan. And I, in this presentation, I will tell you a little bit more about the country. And uh, and its location, geography, and what the and in recent natural disasters, Japan is a. Island nation considered an archipelago, which is a, a large group of islands. Found in East Asia, uh, it's located east of the Korean Peninsula. It has an area of around 140,000 square miles, which is roughly the size of California. And Japan is located in the Ring of Fire, which is a, 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 a ring of uh, a lot of volcanoes, which caused it to have a lot of sis seismic uh, activity, which brings a lot of earthquakes and leads to tsunamis which I will tell you a little bit later more about. Um, the most recent actually hit March this year and devastated the country. Japan has a, a range of climates due to the long uh, geography it has. In the north, it's really cold, and in the other parts of the island, it's temperate. <coughs> the disadvantage of Japan's location is that uh, <coughs> geography is that 15% of the land is, only, is the only uh, land that's level enough for farming. So this, obviously, Japan is not a very agricultural active country. Uh, also, volcanoes, as I said, earthquakes, as I said, tidal waves and hurricanes are very common and a constant danger. Advantages of, of the geography in, in, in Japan and location is that it, bring, it brings a lot of rain. And with this rain, it's perfect for growing rice, which is the main agricultural, if any, main agricultural product. Uh, the ocean also provides abundant fish, which is what most Japanese <coughs> eat all the time. And, um, and it's a very active industry in Japan. The ocean also pro provides protection from invasion, as many as America and many other countries found out during World War II. Um, in, March 11, 2000, in March 11, 2011, uh, an earthquake hit the Pacific coast of Japan. And, it, and that caused a tsunami, which uh, the earthquake was actually the, the most powerful earthquake known in Japan, to have hit Japan. And it was one of the five most powerful earthquakes since the world, since the modern uh, record keeping began in, 19, in the 1900s. Uh, the earthquake, uh, as I said, powered a powerful tsunami, and the tsunami caused a lot of nuclear incidents, which uh, were main were meltdowns at three main reactors in the Fukushima power plant. This affected hundreds of residents around, and uh, <coughs> residents within a 12-mile radius had to be evacuated. The next day, the Japanese police reported and confirmed around 15,000 deaths, 3,000 people injured, and 130 buildings destroyed. Thank you. I will now give the, my, the presentation over to Cameron. And you will talk about government. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cameron Cubis, and I'm going to. I'm the government expert on this topic, and I'm going to talk to you about two major points. The first is what type of government Japan has, and the second is 
how the Japanese government limits trade or doesn't limit trade and how it works with other countries to for its economy. Uh, first of all, Japan is a parliamentary government with a constitutional monarchy. This means that they have the monarch like <coughs> in charge, but then they have all the other ones who make laws. It's similar to a president in all our branches. Uh, but what the Japanese, they don't really limit trade because the government doesn't strictly get very involved with the private companies and entrepreneurs of Japan. They pretty much leave it up to them. But what the government does do is it supports its citizens, such as in times of economic depression, and it also makes sure the living conditions of its citizens are what they believe are fair and equal. Uh, but most business in Japan is run by private, privately owned gov, uh, privately owned companies and entrepreneurs. So there are no big trade embargoes. Uh, they don't limit the amount of imports or exports that come in. They do prefer that the imports <coughs> and exports that come in are raw materials so that their industries can make whatever product they're trying to export. Uh, that's it on the government in Japan. It really doesn't limit any trade. It doesn't block many countries, if any at all. And now I'll let Frankie conclude our presentation. So to wrap it up, I talked about how uh, Japan is a monochronic country. I talked about how it has a high context culture. I talked about the different customs it has. Uh, Tyler talked about what like what is infrastructure. He talked about what is GDP, and he also talked about the major exports Japan has. Alan talked about um, Japan's uh, uh, aim for the economic expansion. He also talked about what kind of market Japan has and how it has a relationship between the U.S. Pablo talked about the location of Japan different geographies it has, and also the natural disaster that happened. And Cameron talked about of how <coughs> Japan has a parliament monarchy, how there's no trade restrictions, and how, how also most of the businesses are privately owned. At this point, I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. Are there any questions? <coughs>